Chat Lecture 9, The Papacy. In his book, Pulp Fiction, Patrick Madrid systematically answers 30 objections to the papacy. This lecture will present a concise version of these 30 objections. Objection 1. Peter was never a pope. Peter is referred to in the New Testament 195 times, more than any other apostle. The second most named apostle is John, 29 times. In addition, when the apostles are named, Peter is always named first, indicating his primacy. That Peter is the only apostle whose name is changed by Christ also indicates his unique role among the apostles, in a similar way that Abraham's and Jacob's names were changed to signify their leadership role. The apostle John acknowledged Peter as leader by his actions, including waiting before the enter empty tomb in order to let P Peter go by before him. In, aff in affirmation of Peter's leadership role, the risen Jesus appeared to Peter before the other apostles. Jesus also indicates Peter's leadership by preaching out of Peter's fishing boat. Jesus signals out Peter by assuring that he will protect Peter's faith from, from the devil. A Catholic explanation for this is that Jesus protects Peter's faith in order to preserve truth in at least one apostle. Catholics additionally believe that all subsequent official papal teachings on faith and morals are protected by Christ from error for this same reason. At least one apostle, the faith will remain true, and that one apostle is the successor of Peter. Other scriptural passages that support the Catholic belief in Peter's primacy include, include Jesus giving Peter the role of feeding my sheep, Peter leading the other apostles in choosing, choosing Matthias, and Peter leading the apostles by preaching on Pentecost. Afterwards, Peter performs the first Pentecost miracle. Still later, Paul acknowledges Peter's leadership by meeting with Peter, who then confirms Paul's faith. Paul's reference to Peter as a fellow presbyter does not mean that Paul was rejecting Peter's authority over the Twelve, which he had previously acknowledged. Rather, Paul was simply referring to Peter as a spiritual brother. And then in the transcript, I provide, <coughs> I provide all the scripture passages that I was referring to. Objection 2. The original Greek New Testament language indicates that Jesus did not build his church on Peter as a rock. According to this objection, since Petra in Greek means large rock and Petros means small rock, when Jesus said he would build his church on a large rock, Petra, and then refers to Peter as a little rock, Petros, with an O-S, he was simply implying that Peter is not the large rock upon which the church will be built. This large rock is Christ, as indicated by St. Paul. In Matthew chapter 16, Peter's primacy over the apostles is demonstrated in three ways. First, Unlike the others, he correctly identifies Christ as the Son of God. Second, Jesus explains that Peter's correct answer comes from God the Father who chose to reveal to Peter Jesus' identity. Third, the truth about Christ's identity was revealed through Peter and did not come directly from the Father or directly from Christ. With respect to the distinction between Petros and Petra as Big Rock and Little Rock, this distinction did not exist at the time of Christ. The word that was used in ordinary Greek at the time for small rock is lithos, but it was not used. Furthermore, Jesus did not speak to the apostles in Greek anyway. He spoke in Aramaic. Chapter 16 of Matthew, therefore, contains a Greek version of a conversation that originally took place in Aramaic, where Peter was called kephas, which in Aramaic means rock. The Aramaic language does not distinguish between a masculine and feminine form for the noun rock. The reason why the masculine form Petros, small rock, is used to translate kephas and not the feminine form Petra, which means large rock, is out of respect for Peter, who is a man. So in Greek, Petros is the masculine version for, uh, is a masculine uh, word signifying a small rock, and Petra is a feminine word signifying a large rock. Finally, it is reasonable to conclude that the context of this chapter of Matthew indicates 
that Jesus intended to give Peter papal primacy. In the following description of this passage from Matthew, interpretation C does not make sense in light of verses A, B, and D, whose interpretations are not in debate. And I'd, I would request that you look at the transcript. Interpretation C of verse 18b is in contradiction with the praise and gifts Jesus gives to Peter before and after verses 18b. So in the transcript you'll see A, B, C, D, and I'll begin with A. A. Jesus praises Simon as blessed. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John. B. Jesus give, gives Simon the new name Peter. I tell you are Peter, Petros. C. Jesus sarcastically calls Peter a pebble since the church will be built upon a big rock and not the small pebble who is Peter. And on this rock, Petra, small rock, pebble, I will build my church. D. Peter promises Peter the keys of the kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So I recommend looking at the transcript and seeing the paragraph that comes before the A, B, C, D and their corresponding scriptural verses. Objection 3. That Jesus called Peter Satan in Matthew 16.23 indicates that Jesus never intended to make Peter the first pope. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus did not institute Peter as the first pope. Rather, he promised he would do so later. Peter was given this role after Jesus rose from the dead, when Jesus told Peter to feed and tend his sheep. After this post-resurrection appearance and commission, Peter gradually took on the duties of his office until at Pentecost, he fully embraced his office. Objection 4. Peter's false teaching that Paul rebuked him for in Galatians 2, 11 through 14 indicate neither Peter nor his supposed successors are infallible. And in response to that objection, Paul was not only correcting Peter for his behavior, Paul was only correcting Peter for his behavior. He was not correcting him for his teaching. Despite Peter clearly teaching at the Council of Jerusalem that Gentiles are not required to follow purity laws, such as eating pork, in order to not to offend Jewish Christians, Peter had stopped eating with Gentiles. This apparent hypocrisy infuriated Paul. To be fair to Peter, though, Paul in his letter to the Romans actually in a way advocates a prudential practice similar to Peter's. In this letter, Paul states this, let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And you can find that Romans 14, 13 through 17. Even if the above advice of Paul does not apply to Peter's actions, Paul criticized Peter for, and presuming that Paul accurately pointed out hypocrisy within Peter, this does not necessarily mean that Paul was rejecting Peter's authority. For example, in more modern terms, if a citizen publicly criticizes his president, this does not mean that the citizen, especially if he's a Christian, is necessarily rejecting the president's authority. Even when a ruler commits hypocritical actions, Christian citizens are called to follow the inspired teaching that Paul gives in his letter to the Romans. And, in, and this is Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due them. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Revenue to whom revenue due. 
respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Paul wrote these words when the brutal dictator Nero was in office. If Paul could in some way accept Nero's authority, all the more so could he accept Peter's authority. Through imperfect leaders, God can reveal his perfect and fallible truth. Scripture indicates this with respect to the high priest Caiaphas. And you can find that with John eleven forty nine to 52 And here we read, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. As the above passage from Scripture indicates, at times God chooses to reveal his truth through sinful men. Other sinful leaders in Scripture whom God revealed truth through include Moses, who murdered an Egyptian, Paul, who was also a murderer but as an accomplice, and King David, who was both a murderer and an adulterer. Objection 5. According to Scripture, Peter did not pass down his authority to anyone else. Apostolic succession, therefore, is a false teaching. In response to this, Scripture does not explicitly describe apostolic authority being handed down. In Acts 1, 15-26, Matthias is chosen to replace Apostle Judas, who had committed suicide. In his letters to, the, to Timothy, Paul directly refers to his apostolic authority that he received from Christ. He also passes down this authority he received to Timothy and warns Timothy to be careful to whom apostolic authority is passed down to. In accordance with Scripture, early church fathers affirmed the existence of apostolic succession. Pope St. Clement of Rome, he, lived from, he reigned as Pope from 88 to 99 AD, does so in his Epistle to the Corinthians, also known as the First Epistle of Clement. Our apostles also know, through our Lord Jesus Christ, that there would be strife and account of the office of the episcopate. For this reason, therefore, inasmuch as they have obtained a perfect foreknowledge of this, they appointed those ministers already mentioned, and afterwards gave instructions that, they, that when these should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. St. Irenaeus refers to apostolic succession in his 180 letter against heresies. In his letter, St. Irenaeus rejects the Gnostic teaching that secret knowledge saves. He does so by appealing to apostolic succession. In referring to apostolic succession, Irenaeus affirms Rome's primacy that was providentially established so as to provide everyone with the opportunity to believe in the true faith without confusion. And in my transcript, I provide key excerpts from that wonderful letter against heresies written in the early church, 180 AD. Objection 6. Since the Roman numerals of the Pope's official Latin title, Vicarius Fili Dei, adds up to 666, the Pope is the Antichrist. Hmm. Against this objection... The title Vicarius Fili Dei has never been used as an official papal title. Instead, Vicarius Christi is an official title, and when the Roman letters are converted into numbers, all they only add up to 214. The reason for the confusion is that Vicarius Fili Dei was used in the forged document, the Donation of Constantine, and mistakenly in our Sunday's Visitors 1915 issue, which has since been corrected by this magazine. Finally, in Latin, the name of Ellen Gould White, who founded the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which sometimes uses this objection, adds up to 666. Does this mean that she is the Antichrist? Objection 7. According to Revelation 17.9, the whore of Babylon is situated on seven hills. Since Rome has seven hills, the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon. In response to this objection, in Scripture, the Greek word ore, in Revelation 17.9, usually refers to mountains, not hills, and the number 7 is probably symbolic. 
Even if Revelation 79 is referring to the city of Rome, which is situated upon seven hills, Vatican City is on its own hill, Vatican Hill, which is not one of the seven Roman hills. Furthermore, although the Pope's Cathedral, St. John Lateran, is outside of Vatican City, and it can be understood as residing along with Rome on the seven Roman hills, it is only a building and not a city. Objection 8. Since Scripture does not ever state that Peter ever in Rome was ever in Rome, he could not have been the first bishop of Rome. In response to this objection, just because Scripture does not say Peter went to Rome does not mean that he didn't. Despite the lack of explicit scriptural evidence, it is reasonable to maintain that Peter was in Rome since no other city has ever claimed to be the site of Peter's martyrdom. According to early Christian writings, Peter was crucified upside down in 65 AD during the persecution of Emperor Nero. Early church fathers repeatedly refer to Rome as the city where both Peter and Paul proclaimed the gospel and founded the church. Church fathers who identify Peter in relationship to Rome in this manner include St. Irenaeus of Lyon, St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Cyprian, St. Jerome, Eusebius. Finally, modern-day archaeologists have provided convincing evidence that the very bones of Peter are buried directly beneath the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica. Objection 9. The modern papacy is invalid since it directly contradicts the simple life of Peter. Response to this objection. The church has developed like a mustard seed. If we do not expect a mustard seed to look exactly the same after it has been planted and grown for a year, then why should we think the church ought to look exactly the same in terms of defined faith and practice shortly after it was first established? An example of a teaching that all Christians accept, which developed and became more explicit, is the Trinity. Although Scripture does not record Jesus explicitly defining the Trinity, the church, relying on the Holy Spirit, organically developed this doctrine. Objection 10. The papacy was invented during the medieval times. In contrast to, in response to this objection, the Epistle of St. Clement, written in 80 AD by Pope St. Clement, is a description of an early bishop of Rome exercising his authority in another diocese. This was accepted since the bishop of Rome was considered at the time as having authority over other bishops. In the following century, Pope Victor I, he reigned from 189 to 199, intervened in a dispute between Easter bishop, Eastern bishops and Western bishops over when to date the celebration of Easter. Pope Victor successfully settled this dispute, and since his authority was understood as entailing juridical power over other bishops. And why does he have that juridical power? Because of the need for unity with the Eucharist, that we are one body. And we take the Eucharist and become more deeply united as one body. Objection 11. Early Christians only saw Rome as first among equals. In response to this, Canon 6 of the Council of Nicaea establishes the jurisdiction of the Alexandrian See on the basis of the Roman See. And I quote, The ancient customs of Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis shall be maintained, according to which the Bishop of Alexandria has authority over all these places, since a similar custom exists with reference to the Bishop of Rome. Similarly, in Antioch and of the other provinces, the prerogatives of the churches are to be preserved. The above canon, along with the previously mentioned early popes whose juridical authority outside their Episcopal see was accepted by other bishops, indicates that, according to the Council of Nicaea, early Christians understood Rome as having juridical power over other bishops and their sees. This prim primacy of juridical power is based on an even deeper primacy, which is the Eucharist, since Christ intends the Eucharist to unite us, not to divide us. Objection 12. The numerous bad popes is proof that the papacy was never intended by Christ. In response to this, Christ chose the apostles, Yet they all acted cowardly when Jesus was undergoing his trial. In addition, the high priest Caiaphas, who is not praised for his goodness in the gospel, spoke inspired prophecy. These choices of God indicate that he does not only eliminate himself, 
limit himself to choosing highly virtuous people to speak on his behalf. Since God is all-powerful, he can reveal his truth without error through weak men, and often does. Objection 13. Papal infallibility is false, since not only did popes live, live bad lies, but they also taught falsehood. In response to this objection, infallibility, the inability to teach error, is not the same as impeccability, that is, sinlessness. Infallibility does not equal impeccability. The inability to teach error is not the same as sinlessness. According to the doctrine of infallibility, in order for a pope to speak infallibly, he must be a pope, his words must pertain to faith and morals, and must do so officially ex cathedra. And this was defined at Vatican Council I in 1870, and I provide the excerpt from that council in your transcript. Another similar error people make is confusing infallibility with inspiration that provides additional public revelation to the faithful. As Madrid pithily explains, while inspiration gives information, infallibility protects information. The role of papal infallibility is to protect public revelation and not to add new public revelation, for as Vatican II's De Verbum clearly states, quote, the Christian dispensation, dispensation, therefore, as the new and definitive covenant, will never pass away, and we now await no further new public revelation before the glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. End of quote. Objection 14. The action of Pope Liberius signing an Arian creed contradicts papal infallibility. Pope Liberius lived from 352 to 366. In response to this, it is unclear if Pope Liberius actually did this, but if he did, documentary evidence indicates that he signed the creed under extreme physical duress, under extreme fear of being tortured and executed by the orders of the Arian Emperor Constantius, who had Pope Liberius arrested and then banished. Infallibility, though, requires that a pope exercise his free will free from external compulsion. Objection 15. The action of Pope Vigilius, he lived from 537 to 555, approving the Monophysite heresy directly contradicts papal infallibility. In response to this, Pope Vigilius never taught nor proved a heretical teaching. He was criticized by early Christians for poor leadership skills and for approving, prior to becoming a pope, three Monophysite heretics in order to gain favor from Empress Theodora, wife of Emperor Justinian I. Also, Vigilius' weak leadership as pope took place when he was being harassed and even imprisoned by the emperor. Objection 16. Pope Gregory the Great's rejection of the title universal bishop is proof that the early church did not see, did not recognize the papacy as having juridical authority over other bishops. In response to this, the title universal bishop can be defined in two ways. According to one definition, the Pope as universal bishop has universal jurisdiction over the entire church in such a way that he may legitimately interfere in the local authority of a brother bishop in order to settle a dispute. According to another definition of the term, the title universal pastor belongs to a bishop who is the only true bishop in whose office all other bishops participate in. Pope Gregory the Great rejected the second definition that was being applied to John the Faster, Archbishop of Constantinople, and he was John Faster was applying it to himself. Pope Gregory, though, did accept the first definition, and this is evident in his interventions in dioceses other than Rome in order to settle disputes. Objection 17. The condemnation of Pope Honorius, lived from 625 to 638, he reigned as Pope during that time, I'm sorry, as a heretic by the Third Council of Constantinople, indicates that the popes are not infallible. In response to this, in reference to the Monothelite heresy, the Sixth Council of Constantinople did condemn Pope Honorius. This condemnation, though, was done without the approval of Pope St. Agatho, 
Pope Agatho neither approved his condemnation nor confirmed the council's decrees because Pope Agatho died before these actions were delivered to Rome. The succeeding pope, Leo II, confirmed the decrees of the council while clarifying that although Pope Honorius had not approved of monothelitism, he ought to have also condemned it. Pope Honorius's condemnation, therefore, was not for heresy but for inaction. Objection 18. If the papacy was instituted by Christ as a principle of ecclesial unity, then why, during the Middle Ages, did three men claim to be pope? In response to this objection, just because three people claim to own a house does not mean one of the three is not the owner. Similarly, just because a number of people claim to be pope does not necessarily mean that no one is pope. Throughout history, there have been anti-popes. God, though, has consistently ensured that in the midst of these weeds, the wheat of the true pope remains. In the Middle Ages, there were a number of powerful anti-popes representing the weeds. During this confusing time, the only valid pope was the pope of the Roman line. Only the Roman line could trace its origins back to the Apostle Peter. Objection 19. Pope Joan, who gave birth to a child as pope before being killed by an angry mob, further discredits the papacy. In response to this objection, two early accounts of Pope Joan's life claim that she lived in different times. The 13th century Metz Dominica chronicler Jean-Pierre de Malay, in his Chronicles, claims that Pope Joan lived in 1099. However, according to other accounts, Pope Joan supposedly lived around 850s. According to highly verifiable historical documentation, the following popes held office during the time it is claimed Pope Joan ruled. And you can look at the transcript and you'll see. And it's uh, lots and lots of historical documentation. All these popes lived during this time. It is not possible for a pope called Pope Joan, a woman pope, to live during this time. Additional evidence even further discredits a woman named Joan from ruling as a pope, let alone existing. And this includes the following. The earliest counts of Pope Joan were written a couple hundred years after her supposed reign. Enemies of the papacy living during the time Pope Joan supposedly lived mention, make no mention of Pope Joan. For example, Photius I, Patriarch of Constantinople, who wanted to discredit the papacy after he was deposed by Pope Nicholas, and that uh, he lived uh, Photius I in the 800s, never refers to a Pope Joan which he very likely would have if he had known her. Photius could have used her reign as a way to discredit the papacy. And the reason why is because of the, the uh, I can read what she did, and you can see why it would discredit the papacy. She's a female pope and for other reasons. Concerning a certain pope, a rather female pope, and this is from the Chronicle uh, of the 13th century, who is not set down on a list of popes or bishops of Rome because she was a woman who disguised herself as a man and became, by her character and talents, a curial secretary, then a cardinal and finally a pope. One day, while mounting a horse, she gave birth to a child. Immediately, by Roman justice, she was bound by the feet to a horse's tail and dragged and stoned by the people for half a league, where she died, and there she was buried, and at the place it was written, O Peter, father of fathers, betrayed the childbearing of the woman pope. At the same time, the four-day fast called the Fast of the Female Pope was first established. So Pope Photius, who lived during this time that this uh, of when Pope Joan was supposedly living, according to one account, he never refers to her. Objection 20. The papal condemnation of Galileo discredits the infallibility of the papacy. Response to this. The Pope's infallibility only extends to matters of faith and morals. The Pope safeguards teaching on how to get to heaven, not on how the heavens run as Galileo taught. Objection 21. During the Crusades, Popes encouraged the murder of millions of innocent, peaceful Muslims. In response to this, 
Ever since the 4th century, Christians have made pilgrimages to the Holy Land. Then, in, in 1009, these pilgrimages were placed in jeopardy when Al-Hakim, the Muslim Caliph of Egypt, commanded Catholics to leave Jerusalem and ordered the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to be demolished. In 1071, Jerusalem was forcibly overtaken by the Seljuk Turks. In response to this aggression, in 1095, Pope Urban II announced the First Crusade. He did so in order to defend Catholics living in Constantinople and Catholics living in the Holy Land. Even though the First Crusade ended in a Catholic victory, subsequent Crusades did not, and Jerusalem was taken by, back by its Muslim conquerors. Despite this apparent defeat, the Crusades were effective in another way, since they weakened the Muslim military power, thereby reducing the possibility of a successful invasion into Europe. Objection 22. Acting as a mere worldly leader, in pride, Pope Alexander, Alexander VI divided up the New World between Portugal and Spain. Response to this objection. In 1493, Pope Alexander II issued the papal bull Inter Cetera. In this bull, the Pope refers to a line of demarcation in the New World between Portugal and Spain. He did so in order to reduce the competitive element between Portuguese and Spanish missionaries and to encourage greater orderly cooperation between these missionaries. He did not intend this division to be interpreted as property boundaries. In 1494, Spain and Portugal signed a treaty, the Treaty of Tordesillas, in which they established colonizing and trading rights. Then, in 1529, the two countries signed the Treaty of Saragossa that divided the known world at that time between Portugal and Spain. In time, as other European countries expanded into empires, this treaty was not followed. Objection 23. Proof of papal depravity is their long-standing support of slavery. In response to this objection, the Catholic Church officially teaches that slavery is wrong. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Seventh Commandment forbids acts or enterprises that for any reason, selfish or ideological, commercial or totalitarian, lead to the enslavement of human beings. End of quote. Prior to the 1992 promulgation of the Catechism of the Catholic Church by St. John Paul II, the Catholic Church consistently condemned slavery. Pope Eugene IV, in his papal bull, Secret Dudum, 1435, condemned slavery. Pope Paul III in Sublimus Deus, 1537, condemned slavery. Pope Benedict XIV in Immensa Pastorum, 1741, condemned slavery. Pope Gregory XVI in Supremo Apostolatus, 1839, condemned slavery. Pope Leo XIII in the Catholice Ecclesiae, 1890, condemned slavery. And Pope Pius, St. Pius X in Lacrimabile Statu, 1912, again condemned slavery. Objection 24. Pope Sixtus IV, IV began and oversaw the Spanish Inquisition under which thousands of Muslims and Jewish people were tortured and murdered. In response to this objection, the term Inquisition comes from the Latin word inquisitionem, meaning a searching into a legal examination. The need for investigating worship and practices of followers of God is explicitly stated in Deuteronomy 17, verses 2-7. through in fulfillment with this ancient practice of the Jewish people, the Catholic Church has investigated the belief and practices of its people in order to preserve and defend the faith. During the late medieval era, these investigations were done more intensely than previously, since heresies were considered not only a threat to Catholic belief, but also as a threat to the political unity of Catholic kingdoms and empires. In order to ensure unity among its people, medieval Christian rulers approved the torture and sentencing to death of unrepentant convicted heretics. The above-mentioned Spanish Inquisition was, after obtaining permission from Pope Sixtus IV, begun by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, who wanted to ensure Spain remains Catholic and does not revert back to an Islamic nation. The Church's role during the time of the Inquisitions, both Spanish and non-Spanish, was not to sentence an individual to death, since this was the role of the state, Rather, the church's role was to determine after trial if the accused was actually a heretic. 
and if so, to then try to convince the confessed heretic to convert. Only if the accused refused to convert did the church then, jarring to our modern mindset, it is important to remember, oh, I'm sorry, did the church then hand over the accused to the state for the punishment? Now, if we reflect on the role of the church in handing over accused to the state to punishment, it is jarring to our modern mindset, and including mine. But it is important to remember that Protestants during the Protestant Reformation also tortured and killed heretics. For example, and we mentioned this before, John Calvin approved of Michael Severitus' 1553 conviction, condemnation, and execution. Objection 25. Pope Sixtus V ordered the publication of an error-filled Latin Vulgate Bible. In response to this, Pope Sixtus V, he reigned from 1585 to 1590, in 1590 planned on officially promulgating an error-filled revision of the Latin Vulgate. This is true. However, he died before he could fulfill this desire. Providentially, therefore, this version was never officially promulgated by the Church. Objection 26. Matthew 16 neither teaches papal succession nor papal infallibility, and yet Vatican Council I refers to this passage when defining papal infallibility. In response to this objection, when defining papal infallibility, the Council Fathers never intended to issue, explains Madrid, formal exegesis of Matthew 16. Matthew 16 was referred to in order to provide reasons for papal infallibility. With that said, the interpretation of this passage by Vatican I, in which Peter is identified as the rock upon which Christ upon which Christ will build his church upon is repeatedly taught by early church fathers, including St. Hilary, St. John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, and St. Cyril of Alexandria. Objection 27. At Vatican Council I, the prominent bishop Joseph Strassmeyer rejected papal infallibility. In response to this, this bishop did not reject the reality of papal infallibility. Instead, he was opposed to defining papal infallibility because the early fathers never formally taught papal fallibility, because previous councils never formally taught papal infallibility, and out of pastoral and ecumenical concerns. Objection 28. There hasn't been a valid pope since, Pi pope since Pope Pius XII. Response to this, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus assures us that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, arguing that there has not been a valid pope for a significant amount of time. There is a period of interregnum between, between reigns, but they're relatively short. Is contrary to argue that, is contrary to this promise revealed to us in sacred scripture. Objection 29. Appealing to Scripture and to the fathers of the Church to defend the papacy is anachronistic. And a response to this objection. Appealing to Scripture and to the fathers of the Church when arguing in favor of the papacy is not necessarily anachronistic if it can be demonstrated that both Scripture and the fathers of the Church support belief in the papacy. This support is present as has been de demonstrated in previous responses to other objections. Therefore, appealing in this manner to Scripture and the Fathers is not anachronistic. Objection 30. Because Pope Pius XII cowardly refused to denounce Hitler, he is responsible for the murder of millions. In response to this, since Pius XII lacked a military force capable of defeating Hitler, he chose to act diplomatically. In so doing, he was able to save thousands of lives that would not have been saved if he denounced the Nazis openly in many ways. Very likely, the Nazis would have retaliated with great severity if he had. As Pope Pius XII once explained, the Italians are certainly well aware of the terrible things take place in Poland. We might have an obligation to utter fiery words against such things, yet all that is holding us back from doing so is the knowledge that if we should speak, we would simply worsen the predicament of these unfortunate people. Pius XII's fears was affirmed by the U.S. The CIA, which cautioned him against outwardly condemning Hitler, 
since the probability determined by precedent was high that Hitler would retaliate violently. However, despite being cautioned, Pius XII did chose to publicly denounce Nazi ethnic cleansing in his 1942 Christmas message. And I include an excerpt of that message in the transcript. Prior to this message, the Nazis had suspected that Pope Pius XII would defend the Jewish people and other people whom the Nazis intended to kill. This was evident even the day after Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli was elected Pope and assumed the name Pope Pius XII. On that day, the Nazi Berlin newspaper Morgan Post described his election as follows. The election of Cardinal Pacelli is not accepted with favor in Germany because he was always opposed to Nazism and practically determined the policies of the Vatican under his predecessor. After World War II ended in Nazis' defeat, Pope Pius XII's anti-Soviet, anti-communist position gained for him a new enemy in the KGB. In order to discredit Pope Pius XII's opposition, the KGB tried to systematically destroy his name. In admitting this character assassination campaign, the former KGB Ion Miha Pachepa said this, quote, In my other life, when I was at the center of Moscow's foreign intelligence wars, I myself was caught up in a deliberate Kremlin effort to smear the Vatican by portraying Pope Pius XII as a cold-hearted Nazi sympathizer. In February of 1960, Nikita Khrushchev approved a super-secret plan for destroying the Vatican's moral authority in Western Europe. Pope Pius XII was selected as the KGB's main target, its incarnation of evil, because he had departed this world in 1958. Dead men cannot defend themselves, was the KGB's latest slogan. Because Pius XII had served as the papal nuncio in Munich and Berlin when the Nazis were beginning their bid for power, the KGB wanted to depict him as an anti-Semite who would encourage Hitler's Holocaust. The hitch was that the operation was not to give the least hint of Soviet bloc involvement. The whole dirty job had to be carried out by Western hands. In order for the character assassination to be done by Western hands, the Soviets promoted and funded a play written by the West German Rolf Hukov under the direction of a communist producer, Erwin Pescator. In the play, Pius XII, is portrayed as supporting Hitler's goal to murder all the Jewish people. This play was first shown in 1963 and greatly helped in spreading a misconception of Pius XII in relationship to the Nazis. God bless.